Hello, everyone, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this conversation with Innes Felizardo, who is currently a trainee at Latham & Watkins and one of our law graduates. Innes, many thanks for agreeing to offer us your insights today, and I wondered whether we could start with where you found yourself at the time of graduating from Cambridge in law. Yes, so when I, so that was probably June 2018, I um, was probably at a relatively low point. I'd come out of a round of applications to vacation schemes. Um, I did plenty of applications um, and I'd only gotten one, which I had, which was Jones Day, which I had done, um, which I then went on to do actually um, that August. Um, that was not successful. And that is at a point that got me to a point where I thought, oh no, um, everyone else is going on to doing their back schemes every, or they already had offers from law firms and going on to doing the LPC. And I just felt incredibly stuck. I felt um, disappointed with myself as well. And I thought, oh no, I think my career may be over before it even started. Okay, well, that's that is quite uh, uh, genuine and honest, and I'm, I'm uh, and it's and you're certainly not unusual in feeling that in in that sort of situation. So I'm grateful that you've uh, uh, been open with the audience about that. What? How did you go about bringing it all back together? What was the sort of process you went through, and the and the and the sort of self reflection that you did at that point? Yeah. So I think I. There, there was a period which I was just, you know, disappointed and a little bit um, upset. But at some point, I had this thought that was, you know, I am whatever I was at the time must have been twenty one. I want to say twenty one, uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and I thought, why, you know, th I'm taking a really defeatist approach to this. I have the rest of my life ahead of me. Why am I thinking that, you know, my career is over before it even started at the, at, in my twenties. Um, and I had this moment where I thought, well, that really doesn't make a lot of logical sense. And that's what prompted me to start reflecting. And I thought, okay, fine. This didn't work out. Why did it not work out? And it got me thinking a little bit outside the box of what would usually be the normal path into career in law, which is, you know, vacation scheme, uh, training contract offer, and on and on and on, which is the path I'm on now. But I, at that point in my life, I thought, okay, I don't have skills. I probably don't have the skills that I need to make myself attractive to employers and to firms. And I thought, well, but how do I get employed by firms if I don't have the skills to be employed by them? Yeah, sure. <laughs> And then I think, okay, so how can I think outside the box here? And one thing that came up to me was, what if I applied to a startup? Um, and that's exactly what I did. And I think in September that year, yeah, September 2018, I, saw, I started working at a startup. I thought it was a good idea because you're kind of a jack of all trades when you are at a startup. So you're not just doing, I was doing a little bit of legal work, sure. But I was also doing, you know, what else needed doing to get what we we're working on across the line. And it also gave me a lot of client contact because there is no one else around, right? It's just your team, your small team, and you have to step up. You have to take responsibility. And I ended up meeting clients that do quite usually um, go to law firms for services. They're big private um, equity players. And I thought, oh, this is great. Um, uh, and it, it gave me some real insight to, uh, as to what the working world actually is. That's good. I mean, what skills do you think in particular that Cambridge should recognize in themselves uh, and realize that they can actually bring to a startup situation from any sort of degree discipline? Although, you know, you did law but and have an interest in law, but how do, how, what should students know about mixing in with a with a startup yeah so I think their Cambridge students are particularly well suited to startups because we're all hard workers that's something we all have in common 
and we all have, I think people generally have this ability to step up when they see the opportunity. So this is, this is what I think is self-selective about Cambridge students. That is a massive asset to startups and that is often overlooked. Um, so your ability to set up, set up, work hard and take responsibility. Did you find just looking ahead to our conversation in a few minutes time, did you find that sort of experience coming up at your subsequent interviews and assessments when you were, came back to talk to law firms? Did it, was it a topic of great interest to them? It was, yeah, they did. They did ask about it um, and ask me about my experience, you know, how did you go on to, to do this thing? And it actually, I think it became a point of interest rather mm. than being something that I had to explain away in any sense of the word. They were quite interested in saying, oh, okay, you did this. So what was your day to day like? What, what were your responsibilities like? And I got a great segue into saying, well, how, how, how long have you got? <laughs> um, and I think it, it does look quite impressive when at a young age, you are able to just juggle so many things at the same time. And mm. that, I mean, that's, that's true across all employers, but I think mm. for law firms is very relevant too. Well, that's great. Um, let's go on to the next stage of your journey uh, that uh, uh, ended with where you are now, but you, you sort of did quite a bit of paralegaling. Yes. So um, after, well, during my placement at the startup, I was applying to paralegal jobs because, again, it was a great experience, but I wanted a little segue into work that was more directly relevant to what I wanted to do, which was corporate law. Um, so harnessing what I'd learned at the startup it, with the skills that I gained, and frankly, the confidence that I gained because you have to you know, be in front of clients and, and want confidence. Um, with, with those skills, I applied to, well, actually, no, I used a recruiter. I sent them my CV and Sort of brief covering letter. Um, they got in touch with me and said, oh, we have these opportunities. Um, are you okay for us to send your CV through? I said, yeah, sure. I am looking for a job, so that's great. <laughs> um, and I got an interview for um, Kirkland and Ellis to be a funds paralegal, at which point, you know, obviously I went. Um, there, was, there were two interviews and a case study. And Actually, a good part of the interview was based on uh, my startup experience and asking me, you know, what, what have you learned? What, what was your favorite piece of work from your experience? And how do you think working there is going to help you become a better funds paralegal? Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that is a sum up of how I got to Kirkland and Ellis. <laughs> And, and being a, a paralegal, though, what's the role like being a paralegal um, in, in a firm like that? How, how do you fit in overall to their sort of operations? So when you were at a big American firm like that as a paralegal, you're not so much as a paralegal as you are a trainee solicitor at that point. The difference is really only in title. Um, and so the types of jobs I was given were the type of jobs that a trainee solicitor in funds was given at the beginning. And then, because we do, as paralegals, we do have the benefit of staying on for longer than six months. Um, as you gain more experience, become more confident, you're then able to progress onto tasks that usually go to NQs um, to negotiate directly with opposing counsel, which is, you know, from NQ and above levels. And, yeah, so that's when when you when you join a big firm like this, that expects a lot of you and gives you a lot of responsibility. You can expect to do at the very least, I think, the same as a trainee, with a great opportunity to just gain more experience as you go and take on more and more and more responsibility. Were they investing in you in the same? Uh, not to be too specific, but did you feel as invested in as a trainee would be, even though you were a paralegal? Um, I don't know the nature of your contract, but you know it would have had a, would it have had a, it could have had a fixed point, or it, there was a, there was more of an end point in view, I suspect, as a paralegal than a trainee would have. So, did you feel you were still being invested in, nevertheless? 
yes, I felt I did feel invested in, and I feel like I there is people do recognize that you tend to move on from a paralegal world to a, a training contract. That that is naturally how it goes, and. This is recognized. I don't think anyone's expecting you to be there for the rest of your life. So in that sense, um, the firm, I would say the, the group actually I was in was quite supportive of giving me interview training, of giving me, you know, just general comments on personal statements and, and, and things like that. Obviously, that was, you know, the partner's goodwill, but it was, they were investing in me in that sense. And uh, but they're also investing in me professionally in that they were giving me harder and harder tasks and, it, it, you know, sort of making sure that I was developing as I went along. So they weren't just thinking, oh, she's going to leave us. So what's the point? They were thinking, OK, fine. At some point, she will leave us. Um, but in the meantime, we can keep on developing and investing in Ines. Um, and in turn, I felt more and more invested as I felt like I got more and more responsibility. So it's it was a very good trade off in my opinion. <laughs> That's great. Uh, good to hear that. Um, and then obviously applying to law firms subsequently, you you're at the point where you were going to give it another go. Uh, how was the experience different this time around? It was very different because at this point I was going in. I was applying to paralegal roles whilst I sorry, pardon. I was applying to attorney solicitor uh, roles whilst I was a paralegal. Yeah. And at this point, I was already going in with so much experience. I was going in having my startup experience. I was going in as a Kirkland paralegal. I'd done a brief secondment uh, with a client before. And all those things helped me. First of all, in my application form, I was able to give very specific, really relevant examples of things you know, we all know the quintessential question of um, tell me about a time that when you were successful, you did a good piece of work or you worked as part of a team. I had it, it was hard to pick the, the, the examples because I had so many examples that were relevant and I could explain them in detail. And I could I think I came across as really confident because I knew very well what I was saying. I'd been there. I'd done that. And then in my interviews, I found them to be easier in many ways, because I think there were less folk partners and graduate recruitment were less focused on my motivation to do law because I'd already spent uh, point maybe 18 months as a paralegal or something. Mm, that's true. Mm. But and they were more focused on my particular experience, who I was as a person. So I felt like I had to prove myself a little less and I could just actually talk about my work and what I was passionate about. Um, so I found it, I found that the whole process was easier and more natural. That's such a key word you use there, passionate about. Um, it's, it is often overlooked by students making applications, perhaps the top, one of the top two requirements that any recruiter looks for in the person they're assessing, the passion. And as you said, you'd had time to develop that passion. So I'm so glad you shared that point. Um, was there any anything tricky? Uh, you talked about it, how, it how, how the experience was a lot more manageable for you and you were a lot more confident. Was there anything tricky that came up or were, that they were querying about at, those, at that point in the assessments? No, not really. I think my experience was more that my previous working experience was more interesting and allowed for more in-depth conversations. Having said that, I do think that you will be expected to have a slightly, I wouldn't say higher, but a, a more reflective um, answer to mm. some of the questions that they ask. So one of the, perhaps one of the trickiest questions was when a partner turned to me and said, okay, so you've, you've been a paralegal for a while, you've worked as part of the team, what's more important, attention to detail? or the bigger picture. Um, and it's a tricky question because it's a false dichotomy. Um, and you have to say, well, it's actually both. Um, so I think they generally expect you to have done a little bit more reflection. But again, that comes naturally as you go through your work and your work experience. It just comes naturally to you. It, it's not, it's not a, a question that you wouldn't be able to answer having, you know, mm. 
X amount of months as a paralegal. So that's the one caveat, but no, it wasn't tricky. I think it made me more interesting, if anything. Great, thanks for that. No, no. let's have uh, a, a moment to reflect on the life of a trainee. And really the, 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 the floor is open to you to, to offer some insights that you think the audience would really value about being a trainee in terms of what they need to know now uh, in order to be prepared for it or to play into it. But, you know, what insights would you give in, in terms of the real, the reality of the life of a trainee? Well, first of all, I would remind people that I, I went in with experience. It was invaluable to have that experience. It was great to turn on my computer on day one and I knew how to write an email to a client if I had to. And that came across in, for example, my mid-seat reviews, and it was really important. Having said all that, and that was the benefit of my previous experience, it is an entry-level job. <laughs> so you're not necessarily expected to go there and get everything right on day one. If you do, fantastic. If you don't, that doesn't actually mean anything. It means that there's a steep learning curve ahead. Sure, but we're not people who, I, I, I say, <laughs> I think Cambridge students are not the kind of people who are scared of that, of that sort of thing. Um, uh, what I would emphasize to anyone who wants to embark in this sort of role in this sort of career is, well, two things really. First of all is kind of a, a very obvious point, which is you work as part of a team. Working as part of a team means you have to be reliable and you have to be very good at communicating. As Because you're, again, it's an entry level job. No one's expecting you to do everything amazingly the first time around, but they need to know that you are going to be there when you are needed and you need to be able to communicate when you're struggling, when you're having difficulties with tasks set, when you're on an annual leave and maybe you cannot actually pick up that piece of work. That is perhaps the most valuable thing that you can bring to a trainee solicitor job, at least in the first the first year, really, I would say. Okay, and I think uh, having looked at your LinkedIn profile, which I'm looking at on my other screen at the minute, um, you obviously feel that there is time to do other things that are both professionally and personally rewarding. And again, I think it would be an insight to the audience to hear it's not all just work when you're in the city and you're in this professional environment. There are other things you can do that are beneficial. Do you want to just give a little insight into the other strings to your bow? Yes, of course. And I think when you work, it is so important to have, frankly, a life outside of work. And I think this is experience, an experience that everyone, well, at least in my firm, we have. Trainee solicitors do have a life outside of work. I certainly do. I have obviously my personal life. I have my cat. I'm getting married. <laughs> Congratulations. Proud. I didn't know that. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now, now to plan the wedding, which is a whole kind of worms in itself. But <laughs> um, but on, on the, you know, I guess the other hand, I also have hobbies. I do. So I'm a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. And um, I have a project where, where I'm essentially with um, to other organizers trying to get people to develop um, a project to do good. So we, we're trying to create a movement at the end of the day. It is a lot of work, but it's something that, again, in the work comes up again, I'm passionate about. And it's a muscle that I'm very keen to exercise that maybe I don't get to exercise as much at work. Um, I get to be more creative. I get to talk to new people that I'd never encounter otherwise. I get to challenge them to do something that is truly good. And that is important to me. It's kind of a non-negotiable. Fine, maybe I need to move my calendar around every once in a while. Um, and I need to deal with things that come up unexpectedly, but I'm still not, not going to do this to dedicate all my waking hours to work. That's just not sustainable. Um, and just a, a little point about that. Do you find the skills that you have in your role actually lend themselves effectively to the interests that you've got outside of work? I know the interest is separate, but do the skills um, la overlap with each other? Oh, certainly. Yes, you have. I think in my case, um, the ability to communicate, being personable, um, the ability to persuade 
people to join what we're trying to do, right? So it, the, the skills are transferable. I will learn something at work. I'll use it in other contexts. I learn things in other contexts that I will use at work. And this is really just part of wanting to be a well-rounded individual, I think. We're not just workers and thinking of yourself just as a worker may actually hurt your development in some ways. Mm, well, that's a great message to to get uh, to uh, to share with us all. Um, finally, and as um, from your own point of view, what piece of advice or guidance would you leave uh, with the listeners uh, that you'd like them to take away from your experiences? Yeah, so I suppose students will be watching this once they finish their exams. They might find themselves at the same point that I was at when I finished my exams. Uh, which was a relatively low point, I would say it's okay. It's okay to feel disappointed. It's okay maybe to feel low. That's fine. But perspective is everything. And don't forget that when you're a Cambridge graduate or you, you know, or you are a Cambridge student, if you are still in, in the middle of your degree, you are an incredibly intelligent individual. You're someone who works hard and who has abilities that are desirable in the working world. That is, that's just a fact. And from there, you have to pick yourself back up and, and think you have, your agent is an advantage, right? You have the rest of your life ahead. Think about if things haven't gone your way, think about how you can reinvent yourself. Think about what perhaps you may be lacking um, and make use of the resources around you. Don't just suffer in silence. I did that. And if I went back, I would say to myself, what are you doing? Go talk to people, maybe go to the career service, um, talk to friends, family, whoever you think might be good at offering you some advice and some new perspective um, and make use of what they say. Great. Well, thanks, Ennis. That's been really interesting talking to you. So thanks very much. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure.